Um, yeah, I'm going to stand just it feels uh, a little less uncomfortable to do so. So uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you to the National Committee. Uh, it's really an honor to be here. Th thanks to everyone for coming out. Um, I'm going to actually talk a little bit less about the book itself and more about a, a set of ideas um, and history that I learned while working on the book. But before I do, I, I want to say what, what the book is not and what this talk is not. Um, this book is not a denial of the extraordinary progress China has made politically, intellectually, economically since the death of Mao. Um, what this book is and what the talk uh, I'll give is it's an attempt to understand some of the, the current of ideas, individuals, intellectuals, um, ideas on the political spectrum, ideological spectrum, which we uh, speak more specifically, which I didn't understand, didn't know about, or ignored until it was apparent that China was um, making a change in its political trajectory. And so um, there are a multitude of ideas and intellectuals in China who are still um, woefully uh, ignored or underappreciated, even in a much more constricted intellectual environment, there are still uh, ideas that are discussed and debated. Um, and so this is just one specific uh, strand or thread of those. Um, so <clears throat> I'll point this in every direction until I figure <laughs> out where the... Uh, Am I blocking it? Uh, it may, well, there's a better than 50-50 chance that I'm not pressing the right button. Um, we could just talk about this slide for the next <laughs> the next 20 minutes. There's a lot here to unpack. Uh, is that? I can also. So um, before I do, there's I I just like these two quotes. One I uh, um, got from an interview while working on the book. The other is from a, a good article that came out right after the collapse of the Soviet Union. But it's particularly the second half of the sentence, which I like and I think about a lot, um, which is um, our predictive theories, the ways that the way, and I'm, this is very specific to Americans, but the way that we think about the trajectories that other countries are on is often types of reflection of where we want the country to go, our own hopes, aspirations, fears, as much as it is an objective look at where that country is or it's going. So, you know, 2008, financial crisis, we start talking about the China model. Um, partly that was a reflection of our own insecurities and anxieties. I think Steve and I will probably agree that there's a, a, an extent of the conversation about China today and where it's going that is a reflection of our own fears and anxieties. Um, second one is from Wang Xiaodong, who's a, um, a, a leftist, but sort of status leftist intellectual, um, who was the co-author of a book in 2008 called Unhappy China, who when I was asking him about um, how did we get China wrong? He said this to me, that we were always seeking out the people who confirmed our own biases rather than seeking out the individuals in China who were articulating a, a different vision for where the, where the country should go. Not to pick on Time Magazine, but if, if um, we were trying to capture a zeitgeist about China's post-Mao trajectory and epoch, I think it's neatly encapsulated in a few covers. Um, one, banishing Mao's ghost, uh, the idea that with the death of Mao in 1976, the whole country had decided that it, it all wanted to move completely away from that Maoist legacy. Um, not only that, but ideologically, they've completely abandoned anything to do with communism. Uh, and this one, you'll notice he's uh, drinking a bottle of Coca-Cola, the Coca-Cola, right? This is fit into our idea that uh, contact with the West, especially America, through blue jeans, Coca-Cola, the internet, Barbie dolls, McDonald's, was going to have a fundamentally uh, transformative impact on the country on its own terms. But actually, if you were paying attention at the time, the signaling from the leadership was, was different. And even a figure as august as uh, Deng Xiaoping, one who clearly believed that China need to make fundamental reforms to its political and economic system if it was going to rise from the ashes of the Cultural Revolution, um, never pretended like he wanted to abandon all of the Maoist legacy. Um, this is from a really fantastic interview he gave in 1980 with Oriana Felici, the, the, the renowned journalist. 
asked pointedly, are you ever going to take that, that photo down from above uh, Tiananmen? And he said, no. Um, that same year, in a series of speeches he was giving as China was writing this celebrated history resolution, where it was finally going to formally decide that the Cultural Revolution was a disaster and that Mao was primarily good but did some bad stuff. Um, the, the resolution is interesting to read, but I think even more instructive is reading Deng's successive comments on the drafts as he's reading this history resolution. Um, and he says to one of the co-authors, a guy named Hu Chaomu, you're being too hard on Mao. You've got to tone this down uh, because if we completely negate Mao, our founding father, where does that leave the party standing? And so there was this difficult balance of there's a lot we got to move beyond of the Maoist era, right? If we're going to modernize, if we're going to integrate with the global economy, if we're going to solidify our, our economic foundation. But at the same time, we can't be moving too far, right? We can't be jettisoning all of the past of the Maoist legacy. What, is, what does the party stand on if we've trashed the founding father? And by way of comparison, I, I think back to uh, the early 2000s when a book came out on Thomas Jefferson and his relationship with Sally Hemings, uh, who was a slave, who he fathered a child with. And I just saw how quickly a camps divided where there were some who would not hear, uh, hear of it. You know, the founding fathers were pure and you do not write scholarship uh, denigrating them. And in its own way, that sort of gives a window a little bit into how difficult the legacy is with Mao. If you, uh, if you quote unquote negate, as the party says, Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, what does that say about the ideals the country was founded on? Um, not a perfect parallel, but at least a, a window in some of the complexity here. And so in that early, um, early post-Mao period, if we should even call it a post-Mao period, um, we pay attention to the third plenum of the 11th Party Congress in 1978, the start of the reform and openings, an extraordinarily important uh, fulcrum or pivot point in China's modern history. But just a few months later, in Beijing, there was a three-month conference that was held. Imagine that. Uh, that would have been fun to attend. But it was a conference on theory. And Deng had said the, the previous December, OK, we're, we're moving forward on economics and, and economic policy. We've got to now unify around one set of uh, one ideology. Right? The party can't, we can't be having all these debates within the party about what we're going to do. And so this theory conference, which was held over a couple months in Beijing, ended with Deng Xiaoping just came back from the United States, putting on the, the, the big 10-gallon uh, hat, um, gave the speech. And he said, essentially, absolutely, we're going to reform. We're going to modernize. But there's going to be guardrails. And those guardrails are the four cardinal principles, which to this day, the party still references. So we will reform, but we're going to uphold the socialist road. We're going to uphold the dictatorship of the proletariat. The party is going to reign supreme. And we're going to uphold Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought. A lot of room for interpretation there. And Deng himself was very willing to be flexible with, with how strictly you were interpreting uh, Maoist, uh, excuse me, Mao Zedong thought. And a lot of the ideological battles in the 1980s were over how you exactly define these four principles. But what it signals to me is, sure, Deng was a reformer. But he, but he never thought, or he held central the idea that the party has to maintain control. And any time he felt like that was being threatened by the reforms or by uh, intellectual currents, he was ready to, uh, to intervene. And so throughout the 1980s, if again one eye were looking at all the reforms and openings, there were these other sets of ideas and political campaigns that were going on that were there to remind us that the party was still concerned about control ideology. Uh, I know. I think Steve was in uh, in China around the time of the spiritual pollution campaign or the anti-spiritual pollution campaign, which is 1982. 1986, you had the anti-bourgeois liberalization campaign, and there's a nice quote from Deng, <clears throat> where in 1980 there's this big crackdown on on crime, economic crime, or what we'd call corruption, and Deng Xiaoping is getting flack for for being a little bit too zealous in this crackdown, <clears throat> but as he says, it's not a crackdown. We never let up. Um, so we've always been concerned with maintaining politic or political control and, and stability. 1989, when Deng showed his most decisiveness in leaning towards party control and political stability over uh, fears of 
political splintering of uh, ideological currents that were coming in threatening the party, an interesting thing happens, and interesting for the story of the book, which is up till this point, we've primarily been talking about intellectual debate at the elite level within the Communist Party and within, within a fairly, fairly narrow bound of, of polls, sort of set by how do you interpret Mao Zedong thought, for example. Something interesting happens after 1989, though, where uh, amidst the, the proliferation of new ideologies, like liberalism, you have a proliferation of more conservative or reactionary uh, uh, ideologies. And one of them was created by this gentleman here, Ho Sin, who is sitting next to uh, a man named Deng Li Chun, who is one of the foremost conservatives in the 1980s. But uh, Ho Sin goes to Peking University a year after the June 4th crackdown and gives a speech to the students. And if you read the transcript, you can see there was a lot of booing as he was calling for support of the party. But notice how he calls for support of the party. He says, I don't know whether socialism is good or not. That's not what I'm worried about, right? I'm worried about stability. I'm worried about is there a party which can make sure our bellies are full and we've got clothes on. It's a much more utilitarian concept of what the party does. Forget about the ideology. I don't care about that. That's, you know, that's tying us down. Forget about all these ideological you know, debates about you know, Marxism or dialectical materialism. What really matters is we've got a political entity which can provide stability, and we need to put our, our weight behind it, because what's the alternative? Cultural revolution, right? Or, or before 1949 and the founding of the PRC, or before you know, around 1911 when the Qing Dynasty fell. That's what we're facing here. So um, this is the beginning of this flowering of neo-authoritarianism, or what uh, Ho Xin was uh, responsible for creating is called neo-statism. There's another gentleman who was important around that time, and he now sits in the Politburo Standing Committee uh, next to this guy. But in the mid-1980s, a young, brilliant professor at Fudan University named Wang Huning starts looking out at the reform process, and he sees that as there's this devolution of power, from the party necessary to reform, you're seeing a collapse of state capacity and state control. And so just basic state functions are becoming difficult because power has been too devolved down to lower levels. So Wang Huning begins writing a series of articles in wonky journals uh, as a professor at Fudan, uh, which came to be known as neo-authoritarianism, but shares a lot as it's a cousin of neo-statism. Wang Huning wasn't really concerned with party ideology. He didn't really care about that at that time. It was about state capacity. Um, can the party, Communist Party effectively regulate, control, govern China? And how much power does the center need? And how should that be balanced with the needs of the localities? Um, Wang Huning disappeared uh, into the political system when he was called up to Beijing uh, in the mid-1990s and has served for, this is, this is longevity here, um, has served for every general secretary up till the present now primarily as a, as a party theorist. Um, but this is, a, this is a good encapsulation of, uh, of what he thought in an interview he did. Um, when there's no central authority or where the central authority is in decline, the nation will be divided and a chaotic state. Right? So he's not talking about Marxism. He's not talking about class struggle. He's just talking about governance capacity. And number five in the standing committee. Number five in the standing committee. Something else happens in the, in the 2000s, and this is actually what I want to focus on for a, a minute because this ties directly to the national discussion we're having now about, quote unquote, getting China wrong. There's this kind of, um, there's this uh, really intense debate in Washington, D.C. about was the whole project of integrating China into the global economy, specifically through the WTO, one big mistake, right? Did we just completely, were we naive? Were we listening to too many businesses uh, or messianic you know, diplomats who thought they could, they could change China? And a lot of folks are coming down on the side of, yes, we were naive. We didn't fundamentally understand that the party always wanted to move towards control, that it was a bait and switch, that the party was fooling us. Now, that, that could sound appealing and interesting, except here's the problem. Every single uh, uh, left conservative in China in the 1990s also thought China was moving in a capitalist direction, right? Um, the neo-Maoists who I talk about in this book would not have existed. The whole movement was born out of 
anger and frustration that with uh, all these moves by these reformists like Zhu Rongji or Jiang Zemin, that China was, as they say, changing its colors, that it had abandoned its socialist legacy, that the party was giving up control. It was inviting in foreign capitalists to, to hawk their wares. And so this gentleman, Han Dechang, who is one of the co-founders of Utopia, the most important neo-Maoist website, which was formed in 2003, became famous for writing this book, Peng Zhuang, or which was against the, it's called Collision. It was against the WTO. Um, he said, if we enter the WTO, China will be divided by foreign capitalists. The party will lose control. We inexorably will be drawn into or pulled into a global liberal order. This is Wang Xiaodong, the, the uh, gentleman I quoted at the very beginning. Um, he also contributed an essay, a, a book, a, a essay to a book about the collapse of the Communist Party, the infiltration of Western bourgeois liberalism through the guise of uh, integration into the global order. So this isn't to say we're, that we shouldn't be having this debate, uh, but it is to say it's odd that up to this moment we haven't really stopped to ask what the Chinese people were thinking at this time. And both the left and the right in China uh, thought the same thing for different reasons. Uh, more liberal intellectuals believed that technology, WTO, um, was going to play a powerful uh, uh, sort of a magnet attraction to pull China's development trajectory towards a much more open, integrated way. And the conservatives agreed and thought that's horrible. The final spark in the sort of creation of this neo-Maoist movement, though, was the Three Represents. 2001, General Secretary of the Communist Party, Jiang Zemin, says, the Communist Party needs to be reforming and modernizing. And so to do that, we need to be drawing in the best talent into the party. And guess what? A lot of ca the capitalists are, are, are pretty talented. Let's open up the party to, to, um, to involvement by the private sector and private entrepreneurs. This was a bridge too far for many of the, uh, the, many of the old traditional conservatives within the party, but even for this newer generation, like the Wang Xiaodongs or the, the Han Dechangs, who thought this was the waving of, I was going to say the white flag, but maybe the sort of the, the dollar sign flag. The party had finally uh, given up any pretense to being anything other than uh, um, interested in foreign investment. So you had in two journals in particular, one is called Zheng Li De Zhuichou, Pursuit of the Truth, and another was called Zhong Liao, which means midstream. These were two journals which were incredibly popular with the sort of old existing Marxist conservative order. And they started writing a barrage of articles in 2000, 2001 against the WTO, against the Three Represents. Uh, the title of this is An International Joke, Capitalists Joining the CCP. Direct criticisms at Jiang Zemin saying, you don't deserve to be the general secretary of the Communist Party. And so in 2001, and, and then with uh, Zhong Liao in 2002, Jiang Zemin shut him down. He wasn't going to have not only personal attacks, he wasn't going to have these bomb-throwing conservatives messing with the policy agenda. And this is right at the time. I mean, a couple months later, China joins the WTO. He does not want to hear this debate and discussion. If this had occurred 10 years earlier, technologically speaking, I think the conservative movement, and again, in the Chinese sense, we're talking about conservative as in to conserve elements of state and ideological control. I think the movement could have died out. But in a way that the sort of li liberal techno-utopians probably didn't uh, think was possible, the internet provided a new tool for this emergent sort of neo-Maoist movement who picked up the gauntlet from these old conservatives and said, we've got to fight for socialism. We've got to fight to keep the party on the on the right road, or they say to keep the red flag waving high. Um, and that's, this is really the backstory to the start of the neo-Maoist movement in and around 2002, 2003. It, it traces its roots back to the very start of the reform and opening. It moves through the 1980s as China wrestles with this constant debate that Deng Xiaoping did between openness and control and trying to get that balance right. It's galvanized by June 4th in 1989 and the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 and this real firm belief that we're next, right? And then it moves through privatization and restructuring of SOEs in the mid to late 1990s where you have tens of millions of state workers who are having their, their iron rice bowl smashed in the name of efficiency and productivity. 
And it, I think it peaks with WTO and the three represents in uh, 2001. And that's where this story picks up, but I'm going to end it here because uh, I feel like there's a tolerance that I'm, I'm uh, rubbing up against for time. Um, but this is the story of neo-Maoism and the story of how this group used technology in ways that uh, I think many of us here didn't think was possible, not to demolish or to erode at old ideologies of control, but actually use these technologies to sustain it. Um, and that story still is with us today. And uh, I'll, with that, I'll abruptly end. Can you take it up to the, that was great. But take it up to the, you kind of stopped in 2001. Yeah. Take it up to the present, those 17, or at least to where the book goes to, it's 2018? Yeah, it's, well, so without taking another 48 minutes to do so, um, I think the, the important part of this element of it, which is um, for, for a lot of the 2000s, China had a, di had a dissident problem. But it wasn't dissidents like Liu Xiaobo. It was dissidents on the left who were increasingly mobilized, organized, and through merging online and offline activism, were challenging the party from its, where it's most exposed, on its left <coughs> flank. Because they're able to say, we call it redder than thou, they're able to say, we're the true guardians of socialism. You're, you're deviating, you're moving away from your first principles uh, as your original intentions, as Xi Jinping would say. Um, and so that challenge has always felt, has left the party exposed and vulnerable. Um, that peaks in 2012 with, uh, Steve and I were just talking about, a, a charismatic um, general secretary in Chongqing named Bo Xi Lai, who provided a, um, a, a sort of a patron for the neo Maoists. And there was a moment in 2011, 2012, where it seemed like neo Maoism was its own organic, indigenous, self-sustaining political movement outside of the Communist Party. Um, that came crashing down on March 14th, uh, 2012, when the Communist Party purged uh, Bo Xi Lai and also shut down every single uh, neo-Maoist website, which by the time there were dozens of them, with uh, um, Estimates are difficult, but sort of north of 100,000 people who are participating uh, in these neo-Maoist events. Um, the story then takes a, a significant shift after that, though. Um, Xi Jinping, who comes to power in November 2012, uh, as he's looking to solidify and stabilize control, is taking stock of uh, threats. And one of them is a raucous uh, online, you know, blogosphere, Weibo. The internet had been providing a platform for challenge rather than support. And so in the same, you know, neo-Maoists have suffered the fate of almost every other element of the, you know, intellectual spectrum as the party has cracked down on the internet and on speech and on, you know, new tools like WeChat and Weibo. The, the neo-Maoists have been caught up as well. And so um, the story when I started the book was, isn't this amazing, these, these communist dissidents? And by the time I finished this book, this was essentially a, a movement which had been hamstrung, handcuffed, uh, and was not nearly as active as it was. And so for me, the really the, the important thing I take away from it is, as I was just as I was running through, um, more complex picture of the ideas which animated some of these frustrations and tensions. And while the neo Maoists have been um, quieted. As have all other, uh, you know, all other, um, um, you know, liberals, conservatives alike, the concerns that they articulated about China's development model, about challenges with income inequality, environmental pollution, uh, technological development, and the impact that will have on future workforce, anxieties about globalization, anxieties over U.S.-China relations, anxieties over China's position in the world, those haven't gone away, even if the parties manage to. Uh, uh, you know, keep a lid on the on the pressure cooker. So the question of what's the legacy of the neo Maoists, I think, as as Zhou Enlai said, it's too too soon to tell. When he was talking about the French Revolution, not the Cultural Revolution, the French Revolution, uh, I think we'll see what the long lasting legacy is. But certainly, where they came from should instruct to me, or sorry, to instructs me about um, some directions that China could be could be going in the future.
When I first went to China, at least my recollection, unless if I've dreamt it, there were three pictures, three huge portraits on Tiananmen. There was Marx, there was Engels, and there was Mao. Yeah. Obviously, Marx and Engels have it been taken last. down. Um, as a symbol, do you think they take Mao down? Obviously, Deng says we don't. You think they take it down? I don't think the Communist Party takes it down. I think if, that's, if that picture comes down, something much more fundamental in terms of who rules China will have happened. Even though we see, we can, even though the, the, we've seen obviously a tightening, but we continue to see more reporting on some of the excesses of the Mao era, whether yeah. it was the Great Leap Forward, stuff continues to come out, the number of deaths. There's, there's still research being done, um, which becomes public through indirect ways. But you yeah. think no. Yeah, I think that debate is, you know, I think the, the party has recognized uh, how fundamental the, the Maoist, its version of the Maoist legacy is to, I mean, look, we're, we're leading up to the 70th anniversary of the PRC, uh, one of the, the big popular shows right now, and a new movie, I should add, are about Mao Zedong in China right now. So they're not, they're not backing away from this. It, what they're trying to do is, is, look, we do this here. I remember growing up, what's the story I learned about George Washington, the, you know, cutting down the, 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 uh, the cherry tree. We all beautify our, our founding fathers, but for the party, it's got to do a lot of beautifying uh, because you've got, you know, any history, any, any uh, popular portrayal of Mao Zedong in China um, usually ends sometime before 1958. Oftentimes, it'll end in 1959, right, because it's still contested how you talk about those periods, even a cultural revolution. So the cultural revolution, which gets a good deal of coverage in the 1981 history resolution, which is still to this day... Um, that's where you go to reference w where the accepted space for historical research is. Um, it talks about it as, as a catastrophe. But even within that, there's way too many specific stories that are, are too difficult. You know, how do you talk about Liu Xiaoqi, you know, who was, uh, who was put in prison at the start of the Cultural Revolution and died there? And they didn't announce his death until the early 1980s in the, uh, like a ping pong magazine or something. There was just a little blurb saying Liu Xiaoqi, oh, it mentioned his, his widow. That's how they announced that Liu Xiaoqi had died, you know, 15 years earlier. Uh, how, do, how does Xi Jinping talk about his legacy during the Cultural Revolution and that of his father? Um, so there's just, I think the party has, you know, how do you wade through that thicket and come out clean? Much better to use a lot of resources to clamp down on debate. Um, and so, you know, one of the first things Xi Jinping did in 2013 is he announced a new mass line campaign. And as part of that was a battle against historical nihilism, which uh, continues to this day. One of the areas that neo Maoists have found a safe space is in roving the online, you know, uh, roving online looking for instances of, of historical nihilism, which can be anything to uh, trying to revive or resuscitate Gorbachev's legacy, which is seen as an indirect, indirect um, you know, support of reformers in China. Uh, or it could be anything on. There was a book written uh, by an um, uh, author named Fang Fang called Soft Burial about the early land reforms in the early Maoist period. Um, her book is now banned in China after a campaign by neo-Maoists because it, it spoke too harshly of the land reform campaigns in the early 1950s. Um, so the party recognizes the threat of history, all authoritarian regimes do, uh, and spend an awful lot of resources trying to... Uh, contain what can be talked about um, and make sure it's their version of the history uh, that, that, that is being discussed. Did you visit his birthplace and the museum? Uh, Mao? Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, I uh, spent a really amazing, so um, Shaoshan, which is just outside of Changsha, if you want to track how the party's thinking about Mao's legacy, track spending on what they call red tourism, <laughs> the amount of money that they're putting into reviving and, and making really pretty extraordinary, all the, what they call the red holy sites, Shangdi, of Mao's birthplace in Shaoshan, Zunyi, uh, Jinggan Yan'an, you know, just ton of tons of money in all these important uh, stepping stones in Mao and the Communist Party's road to power are receiving extraordinary amounts of, of funding um, to, uh, you know, to make these real tourist attractions. And so Mao's is a really you know, it's an extraordinary place to, to go and to visit. Uh, it's a neat window into uh, yes. uh, his legacy. Trip. Yeah. Now, you said, did Americans get it wrong in 2001? Did we? No. So you think they understand? The book suggests we didn't. Yeah, and China changed. You know, I think 
Well, first of all, imagine we were sitting in the room and it's 1995. What case would you make for not bringing China into the WTO? And that's actually an open question, I, even though my facial expression didn't indicate it was. Uh, you know, I'd be really curious to hear at that moment, when you're getting these signs of Jiang Zemin is, you know, we're talking less about ideology. We've got this, you know, 1998, we've got this premier in Zhu Rongji who's coming in and he's talking about marketization, efficiency, privatization. Um, you know, China is now moving up this professionalized cadre of, of bureaucrats within the state council who are educated abroad. What would be the, what would be the, the, you know, the argument that we should block them from joining the global trading order? Um, so the story to me isn't what happened in 2001. The story is what happened around 2007, 2008, 2009 where we see a pretty a significant shift in domestic politics in China, the way it interacts with the world. Uh, we, you know, we date this to 2012 with the rise of Xi Jinping, but I, I think you know, the new revisionist history is all of this, you, know, you can pull all that back three or, four, three or four years to when you really start to see a change in China. Um, so I think it's easy to talk now about how naive everybody was. You were, you know, you've been engaged with China for a very long time. I landed as a student right as they joined WTO. I mean, it felt like you know, this is a place that was continuing to, uh, you know, release the shackles, integrate itself, professionalize. You know, you talk with, I remember just talking with students my first couple days of, of class, and it confirmed everything I thought about where China was heading. So um, I think it's an ideological argument that's made to try to block off a certain, uh, you know, certain way of dealing with China anymore, rather than it is a serious historical investigation of mm -hmm. what the option set was. I guess two questions is one, hasn't China, I mean, you mentioned all the different campaigns in the 80s and in the 90s, hasn't China's development been like this yeah. anyhow over these 40 years Yeah. Um, is question one. And then question two is, isn't China still changing today? You know, the idea in Washington that China is this static uh, country with a monolithic view is completely inconsistent with my experience. Yeah, maybe this is one where I'm less optimistic. Um, so we've always seen these, what do you call it, a pendulum swing or what Deng Li Chun used to call the Fang and Shou periods, the tightening and the relaxing periods have been cyclical in Chinese politics. Um, but we could usually identify the mechanism which, which wrenched the pendulum back in one direction or the other. Oftentimes it was Deng Xiaoping who had the credibility, charisma and authority within the party unchallenged, right, sitting above everybody. Um, first among equals, who was able to, when he felt it was going too far in either conservative or a, or a, uh, a liberal direction, like price reforms in the summer of 1988, he was there to say, all right, we're, we're moving back. Without Deng, you then had a series of incredibly powerful party elders who had their own power bases, charisma, authority, overlapped with Mao, and were, were also there working behind the scenes to affect policy changes. You had ministries, which had their own power bases, which were there to assert authority and control when they felt policy was moving too far in one direction. I'm, I'm very concerned now because it looks like all the mechanisms which affected the pendulum swings have been intentionally demolished as the direct result of a power consolidation by the current general secretary of the Communist Party, Xi Jinping. Um, I think this is intentional because if you're a leader of any system, democratic or, or authoritarian, you want to be calling the shots, and if you've got the power to consolidate authority, you do. Um, there's no, I think it's no accident, he abolished term limits. Um, so uh, on that sort of pendulum shift issue, I know we talk a lot here about we need to be careful, we don't want to marginalize reformers. I, I think the guy at the top's marginalizing reformers. Um, you know, Xi Jinping is the one who's marginalizing reformers, and we have very little control over that, I, I, I think. Um, so, you know, to the second question of China still changing, yes, absolutely. You know, just visit there and you'll see that. But in the narrower sense of the political authority sitting at the top, I feel it's becoming highly ideological, rigid, restricted, nationalist. Look, we got our own problems here, but I think we've seen the real danger for me is we've got the leadership of the two, the second and f first and second largest economy who have, shall we say, their own peculiar ways or thoughts on governance. Um, our idea is that China is sort of planning 48,000 years into the future. That doesn't, that, that doesn't make sense to me. I think it's becoming much more reactionary, slow, 
Um, look at look at its you know look how it's dealt with Hong Kong, which has been a to sit there and, and essentially do nothing um, for three plus months and then finally give a concession where if it had given that concession on June 10th, if it had felt confident, uh, may have had um, we've seen may see the, the situation uh, very different from what it is now, but instead it, it stalled, delayed, thought time was on its side, and the movement has grown and grown. U.S. China relations. If China had a year and a half ago or two years ago gone all in on a big ag purchase, back when the debate was just narrow on the trade deficit, gone all in on a big agricultural purchase, you know, made a mealy mouth statement on IP, um, but instead it was trying to, you know, it was trying to field Donald Trump out. And so now all it does is tit for tat. And where's that getting? Forget about the U.S. side, but just if you're in Beijing and you're advising Xi Jinping, how has that strategy been working for you? Um, so China society is extraordinarily complex. We'll always be, you know, leave Beijing and you'll question this idea of a monolithic Communist Party running everything. But unfortunately, I focus mostly on Beijing, and that's where I get pretty, pretty pessimistic. Mm -hmm. How does the third plenum of the 18th Party Congress fit into your view of what's going on in China? The, Which was the plenum that the, called for yeah the non reform. the, the non plenum as I call it uh, except the, it was a plenum and it was the, the still to be delivered upon uh, plenum where uh, uh, Xi Jinping uh, and the Communist Party announced a pretty aggressive set of of, of less specific policies but we're going to have market forces uh, uh, be allocating resources. Um, uh, it happened, absolutely, the, the party announced that. It shows you that as of 2013, those voices were, were still strong enough to push that onto the agenda. Um, I would say, though, tell me about Xi Jinping's speech at the 19th Party Congress, which outlines a, a, a vision of the opposite of that. And a party speech at a party congress sits way up here in the hierarchy of party documents and is the visionary statement for China for the next, uh, for the next five years, at least. And so that, to me, would take precedence for where I think the leadership is thinking rather than uh, the third plenum. But I am wrong 99% of the time about Chinese politics, so uh, <laughs> this could be yet another example of that. I mean, because it, it leads to, you know, you, you, I always, because, well, what happened? Yeah. I mean, a plenum document gets very heavily vetted, yeah. whether it's the, you know, the speech at the, you know, at the party congress itself, which is even more heavily vetted. But this is not something yeah. which kind of, just is created as an outlier and doesn't have a lot of support. So it's puzzling, and I agree that it has not been substantially implemented. Um, you know, I guess is you know this the plenum that third plenum document came out in the fall of 2013. Xi Jinping had been in power less than a year. A lot of that document draws from the World Bank tw China 2030 report, which had come out the year before. Um, I guess, and just in, ter in terms of bureaucratic politics. The, and, and actually, you hit the nail on the head that uh, way too often we hear a document or a speech from a party leader and we imagine it's responding to events that day. But bureaucratically, think how long it takes to get a speech from conception all the way up to the leader's desk, right? Think about a plenum document, how long it takes to get that all the way uh, to, to, to make it onto the docket of a plenum. The third plenum, uh, the, the actual document which came out the third plenum, I guess, is started at least 10 to 12 months prior. Right? Just about the time Xi Jinping is coming to power. He comes in. That one's already baked in. Good luck you redirecting that one. So it goes through. Look at the plenary sessions after that when Xi Jinping starts to gain control. Now I think we're seeing Xi Jinping. And, and to just one final piece of evidence. We've got a fourth plenum coming up in October. Yep. The third plenum is usually the econ reform plenary session. The third plenum was last spring. Right? It was not on uh, party, it was not on um, uh, economic reform. It was about uh, planning for the upcoming MPC session, which was about, at that MPC National People's Congress session, was the single most uh, audacious grab of power of, uh, from the State Council by the Communist Party. Right? The fourth plenum, which is coming up, they could, if they wanted to, have that be the reform plenum to kind of reset the clock and to, to pick up for the, the missed economic reform plenum. But guess what it's about? the Communist Party, and about discipline and, and, and about inter-party inter -party regulations. So uh, as we've seen Xi Jinping's power uh, consolidate and him have more uh, um, uh, authority and control, 
as we move along that time scale, we're seeing more and more talk of the party, the party's role, the state sector. Uh, so that's why I, I, I wouldn't, I'm not expecting the sort of third plenum to be implemented yeah. anytime soon. Yeah. Um, I think the, the, the day late and a dollar short view of the way the Chinese are conducting themselves in U.S.-China relations and with Hong Kong, I think is, is uh, probably, it, I don't agree with that view. I think if you look at the history of the trade negotiations, the Chinese have reached four agreements with the U.S. side. They've reached an agreement with Secretary Ross. They've reached an agreement with Secretary Bush. They've reached innumerable agreements which the president has decided are not strongly enough in America's interests. So you say the Chinese could have played it better. It's tough to play it better with somebody who changes the rules at the last minute. And the false narrative that pervades in Washington is similar to the false narrative on climate change, on immigration, on a whole host of other issues. The difference is that with respect to China, people have tended to believe it, even though I, I think it is a fundamentally flawed narrative. And the idea that a bilateral trade deficit matters, oh, please. I mean, I think high school economics teaches you that that's, that's not the case. Uh, I think with respect to Hong Kong, um, that the extradition bill, which was fundamentally flawed, was an initiative of the Hong Kong government. It did not come from the, the Gong Alban. It did not come from the NPC. It came from the chief executive of Hong Kong, and they were slow in responding. But they actually were living up to the one country, two systems initially by saying, all right, this is your decision. Uh, you know, we, we think it's okay. It's not a bad decision, so we'll go with it. And then they were, they were very slow in reacting, didn't know what quite to do. But, you know, this wasn't, it, it wasn't their initiative, so. Bill. Yes, uh, hi, I'm Bill Armbruster, retired journalist. How are Deng Xiaoping and Zhu Rongji viewed in China today? That's a good question. Uh, I may defer to Steve on the Zhu Rongji question, because I actually don't have a strong impression of how Zhu Rongji is felt, uh, you know, other than w w Steve gave me a tour and, and he showed me there's some pictures of, you know, Hu Yaobang and was saying, you know, young folks don't recognize Hu Yaobang. You know, Zhu Rongji is still, uh, um, you know, I think, shows up at important, you know, party and state meetings, is still widely revered for his role in, um, you know, in, in China's economic reform efforts in the late 1990s and accession into the WTO. His, if you go to any bookstore in China, you'll see Zhu Rongji's remarks translated. That's the simple version. I don't know just more fundamentally, though, how he sorts into the big picture of sort of the party's, you know, historical narrative in a way that, you know, Deng Xiaoping, Deng Xiaoping does. What's interesting with Deng is I think um, his legacy is fundamentally challenging for Xi Jinping. Um, one is just historical, you know, let's go four or five years into Deng Xiaoping's time in office, such as it was. He didn't hold that many offices. But you had normalization of relations with the United States. You had start of reform and opening. You had the successful negotiation of handover of Hong Kong uh, to China, with not a bad nationalist project, all by 1984. Um, Probably starting a debate here, but I uh, I have difficulty thinking of uh, anything significant that Xi Jinping has done that has fundamentally um, put China on a much better direction when compared to when compared to Deng Xiaoping. Deng uh, in in the historical uh, anniversaries of Deng, it's been extraordinarily muted in uh, in China. Um, I think the Dungus legacy may be trickier for Xi himself to, to navigate than the Maoist one. Um, so, um, arguing against myself, they did just put out a massive, like, 100-part series on Deng Xiaoping on CCTV a year and a half ago. So it's, the guy ain't forgotten. Um, but uh, I think it's a challenging legacy uh, for a leadership which is not as invested in fundamental reform as, as Deng was. But um, I'd actually love to hear if I'm... If you've got uh, a different view on that. No, no on, Dung, on Dung, it's it's become more difficult for the, the current government to kind of praise Dung unqualifiedly. So, I mean, it's, it has raised issues. I think Zhu Rongji, you know, 
former Chinese leaders don't generally speak out. Mm. You know, they're, they're, they're up there, you know, in the pictures they're there, in the funerals they're there, um, but they don't make a ton of speeches, and Zhu Rongji does not, does not make a ton of speeches. Um, in the context of thinking about Xi, how do you view his anti-corruption effort? I mean, so he hasn't done anything. I mean, corruption was a cancer oh. on the Chinese Communist Party. I mean, it, it was really out of hand. All right. So it, of the eight years he's been in power, his, the, the one thing he's done is to purge a significant number of cadres, some of whom just coincidentally happen to be his political enemies, uh, in a tactic which helped him consolidate power rapidly and effectively in his first two, two years of office. Undeniably, there have been some positive effects of taking graft down from the level of overt to, to covert. Uh, I mean that sincerely. But um, we could argue whether that should go as, like, signature achievements that have fundamentally worked for the long-term betterment of, of China, but open for, open for debate. Other questions? A lot of questions. Uh, let's go in the back. Yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um, Stacey King from the Retail Advice System. Congratulations on the new book. Um, I, my, my question is that uh, uh, Xi Jinping has repeatedly, both publicly as well as in the Communist Party, saying that um, tell the Communist Party members to look at the history. Um, and then you always, like, history could be, it's always repeating. I guess my question is based on your 40 years um, study or the study of the 40 years history of the party, which part or what element are you seeing right now that the Communist Party is repeating or potentially? And my second question, sorry. Can I do one just because I saw there was a bunch of other questions? Um, that's a good question. Are you thinking of a certain period that you're seeing it repeating? Is that a loaded question? I'm asking because you spent so much time. I, I think this is, I think we were talking before about the idea of we're talking about are we in a new Cold War? And I felt that sort of trying to, to jam this current moment into an old historical you know, framework to make sense of where we are today doesn't work for me in the Cold War. And similarly, I'm really hesitant to talk about this as a return to. Um, maybe that's because I'm just not a good historian, but, um, you know, you hear talk about personality cult, return to the cultural revolution. You know, we're not seeing, you know, I think that's a, an inapt um, comparison. Um, I, 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 I see historical, you know, sort of connectivities and legacies that are still existing, but this is sui generis, I think. Like, I don't think the party has a f historical <coughs> framework for where we are now. I mean, none of us do. This is just an extraordinarily, um, this is a really confusing time. Um, and f framing what's happening with the Communist Party now as a sort of a return to X period, if you've got one, I honestly would love to hear it. I, I, none of them sort of pop to mind to me because there's just so many extraordinary differences now, you know. So, sure, we're seeing a sort of resuscitation of a form of Maoism, but it's pretty tame. And it's within the lens of, you know, Wei Wen, you know, control stability. Xi Jinping may be kind of a Maoist, but he's not talking for, you know, Zhao Fan Yoli. He's not talking for, you know, storm the barricades. Um, so, yeah, I can't, none, none comes to mind. That's, yeah. So I found your analogy with the Red Guards really interesting. You know, it conjures up this image of upset youth out there on their own in a chaotic situation. But in reality, the Red Guards were manipulated and used by internal political forces for specific reasons, you know, from like, attacking Liu Xiaoqi to making a new foundation for nationalist growth, whatever. So I found this particularly interesting when you talked about how this Red Guard that you studied had been sort of thrown by the wayside. And I wonder whether or not you thought about the idea that perhaps deep within the party, uh, to go on, uh, like, uh, Xi Jinping's done a speech from the Central Party School. school. So when you were talking about different intellectual debates, it always made me think that what's more important is what is the party being taught? How much, how important is Mao in there? What is the, you know, political works within the PLA? So my question is, do you think that perhaps this new co cohort of Red Guards was useful by the center for pieces that wanted to sort of maintain the Mao's direction and the criticism while they were experimenting with economic policy? And then whenever they started to solidify their political grip, they were thrown by the wayside and sort of from within the party school and within the party that 
official Maoist control of the Strong? Uh, I'll first slightly take issue with a framing of if we think of Red Guards and the Cultural Revolution as tens of millions, you know, millions of, of, of kids who are kind of brainwashed. Um, you know, I've talked to a lot of former Red Guards. Uh, it's a really com there's complex reasons people showed up on the streets, and the idea that the party or Mao was able to, or you had these varying factions who were, um, you know, pulling levers. Um, sort of, I, I, I don't necessarily agree with, but that actually doesn't contradict the framing of your question was, was it useful, or were these groupings useful? Um, and so to, your, to the second part of your question, 100%, uh, you nailed it. Like, yes, that, that's the, um, and it, I think I say it in the introduction of the book, that what explains the longevity of neo-Maoists was, and talk to any neo-Maoist, they got there on their own, right? They, they came to join these websites or these protests through their own journey, frustrated <laughs> by what was happening at the top. The question is, why didn't the party crush them way before 2012? And the reason is, they were absolutely extraordinarily useful for certain elements within the party uh, apparatus, the party elite, who were looking to, it's called radical flank theory. So we got a political spectrum. Here's the center. Here's the center of policy, right? You're kind of here to the left. A, a good way to get, to make you seem reasonable is to have someone here, right? And you can say, look, what I'm saying is reasonable by comparison, right? Um, so Neo Mouse have always has always played that role, but they've always you know they've always been um, they've had powerful people within the party who have who have um, overtly participated in their activities. Zhang Chuanjing, who is the head of the organization department in the, in the 1990s, uh, speaks at Neo Maoist events. Uh, Hu Chaomu's uh, son and daughter Hu Mu Ying and, and, and uh, Hu Shi Ying speak at Neo Maoist uh, activities. They got powerful people at the top who find Neo Maoist useful. Uh, as a as a sort of a left flank to be to be pushing back on uh, specific policies that the that the party that the party uh, apparatus is putting forward. So definitely, there's there's politics at work here. Right in front. 1989. Do you think among the current leadership, even among intellectuals, there's a sense that China is on the right side of history, meaning that despite the 1989 Tiananmen you know, event. That China somehow managed, you know, went on with the reform and opening up and joining WTO. You know, in thinking back, do they think that that's an, you know, a kind of sacrifice that's worthwhile? Yeah, because I have heard a lot of uh, thoughts even among Westerners who believe that the students' movement actually would have set back the history, you know, from the trajectory of, you know, reform and opening up. So I don't know. Within China, currently, if there's a consensus, and therefore that would embolden them with respect to the current Hong Kong situation, because they feel the way you come out, mm. you know, still ahead. Uh, so I've never a able to answer any question that asked me what I think the Chinese people think, because mm -hmm. I have no idea. I can say that some of the people who I interviewed, you know, I spent five years interviewing people for this book. Um, Broadly speaking, I would say a good portion of them kind of agree with your framing of it, which is, um, and some of the, the neo Maoists were, were, were protesting in Tiananmen Square, uh, but still have a sort of complicated reckoning with it, which is they understood the, the underlying ideas that were motivating the protests, but feel, especially in light of 1991, the collapse of the Soviet Union. I think that shifted the debate about whether the party, for some of these folks, was right or wrong in 1989. The, the collapse of the Soviet Union, I think, solidified for a lot of these individuals uh, that, although brutal, that was a decision that the party leadership had to make if it was going to hold China together. That's a very narrow answer to your question, because I, I haven't a clue what. I don't, I don't ask many people about that when I'm in China. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Go ahead. Um, where do the university Marxist uh, societies fit into this analysis? There, yeah. There, I mean, there, were, there was a lot of um, you know press about that. There's certainly neo malice yeah. and their orientation in terms of a class analysis of society. You have student worker solidarity yeah. uh, movements that are reminiscent of the Mao era. Um, where does it fit in? How widespread is it? And how much sympathy is there for those students? 
Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, good question. The, the last two parts of that are hard for me to answer because I, I just don't know in terms of how widespread is it and, and how much sympathy is, it, uh, is, is there for it. Um, so uh, just uh, an anecdote comes to mind that uh, in um, the, the lead up to, in, in fall 2017, I was on the campus of Tsinghua University talking to Cui Zhiyuan, who's a, 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 a left intellectual, new left intellectual. And I asked him if they were going to be commemorating um, 100 years of the Bolshevik Re Revolution. And he said, we were, but we were just told by the party secretary and the university that we can't do any activities. Um, and so the, they had to wait till January before they could finally do anything. After the sort of party had done the official celebration, you know, pretty staid and contained and, and told you what the right narrative was. And then they gave you permission to do, do your own events. So I just, th there's, there's folks who are still wrestling with actual real Marxism and, 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 and sort of class analysis, but are finding it incredibly hard, hard to do so because you know, it's a fundamentally volatile, threatening ideology or, or set of ideas uh, to be thinking about openly, given a lot of the contradictions that China's you know, uh, uh, economic system is dealing with. More specifically, on the um, a series of protests at a, at a factory called JASIC in southern China broke out uh, about a year ago, my, about a year and a half ago, a year ago. Um, and this was, uh, we've seen a lot of labor protests in China. That's not new. But what was new here is you had this whole um, movement of elite students, so students at China's best universities, who were going down and participating in demonstrations in, in southern China and, and doing so articulating their vision in square in, smack dab in socialist Marxist terms. So basically saying to the party, you've been teaching us about Marxism and socialism all this time. You're absolutely right. We are here demonstrating on behalf solidarity with the workers based on the ideas that you've, uh, you've articulated. One, uh, one young activist who was eventually thrown in jail wrote an open letter to uh, comrade Xi Jinping uh, saying, I'm so glad you're talking about socialism. I, I completely agree. We've got to do something. I think you'll agree. We've got to do something about the worker situation down here. Um, you know, that was a, that's a difficult uh, circle to square or square to circle. I forget which way it goes for, for a communist party. It did what it usually does. It's muscle memory, which is it threw everybody in jail. Um, and so it crushed, it crushed this incipient movement. Uh, Mao Zedong said uh, a single spark can start a prairie fire. Um, the communist party started with 12 people in a room in Shanghai in 1921. It knows small things can evolve to become big things. Uh, the lesson is nip things in the bud. Uh, and it's better to take uh, um, it's better to take criticism that we're being hypocritical by crushing Marxists than it is to see the alternative. So um, yeah, that that was a remarkable moment because it clarified the contradiction between a communist party which has no room for actual communists. Steve, I think Jude used the three different words to actually encapsulate the question I was talking about: the superficiality of the communist party that you talked about. That layer is extremely thin now. So what I'm hearing from people in China, and I travel there quite extensively, is that layer is getting thinner and thinner. And that's what the Communist Party is most afraid of, the spark. Is that the sense you get in your research? Despite what I just said, I don't actually think they're, I don't think, they're worried about social unrest. I think what probably keeps the party leadership awake, and it certainly keeps Xi Jinping awake, is not at the, at the grassroots level, a movement starting. Uh, I think he's worried about one of his, his uh, fellow comrades at the se senior leadership uh, organizing uh, and, and trying to unseat him. That's usually what, what frustrates or concerns authoritarians. Most leadership changes happen not because of popular protests or mass protests. It's, it's intra-party elite struggle. I think my question is more about in the party, because the layer is very thin. They used, they used to have a very thick layer to protect the party. That layer is thinner and thinner, and this is just the party elite fighting with each other. So if the fight is going to happen, it's going to be happening at that thin layer, not in the vast population. What, what's the layer? The layer of what are you the referring party. to? But a lot of people. What is the layer of? What is the substance of the layer? It says the the adherence to the communist stock, communist party. Many mm -hmm. communists that I know, they are superficial. At yes. Just they just they are communists when they are attending a party event. Other than that, they don't actually believe in a single value of the Communist Party. 
They, yeah, I mean, there's 91 million of them. You know, I know Communist Party members who certainly don't aren't died in the world Marxist, but but believe in in the role of the party as a as a stabilizing, galvanizing force for China. But that's the norm. Yeah. 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 yeah um, Steve, how much time do I have? No, we still have time. Well, how long is the question? <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll, I have a lot of questions about what you've said, and, and it's much more complicated, as you yourself know. All right, let me try and stick to two points. Um, I agree with what Steve said about the Hong Kong situation. However, I have enormous problems with the idea of how strong Xi Jinping is, partly because I don't see his level of political sophistication and adeptness as being particularly high. And particularly, I wanted to emphasize this point, even if it was a local Hong Kong office that instituted the question of this um, expedition, if he, he, wanted, he wants to be the top leader in the country, well, let him show the leadership, and he should have been the one to intervene on June 10th and just, you know, completely abrogate the possible demonstrations later on. My other point of reference is this whole question of neo-Maoism, as you described it. And if I think of Po Xi Lai and I think of um, Xi Jinping, particularly given their fathers and what the fathers' relationship was with Mao during the Cultural Revolution and so on, that this again, as you said, um, a genuine Marxist group has tremendous problems because of precisely because of these contradictions. And, and, so. and my point is that it's almost ludicrous for them to describe themselves as neo-Maoist. I might see them as neo-Leninists, but which Maoism are they talking about? Pre-Cultural Revolution? Post-Nixon? I'm just curious. To, I'll leave it at that because there are too many other things. Yeah. That's a, that was a question, the second one? Yeah. W which Maoism are they referring to? Yeah, well, uh, I have my own. Yeah, I mean, well, the the level of sophistication on a lot of these people in thinking through that which Maoism question is you, you'd be disappointed, um, and it's it's um, when they say when they say neo Maoist, um, what they mean is essentially a stitched together imaginative version of the glorious past that um, pulls all the good things that they like um, conceptions of. Um, income inequality, uh, safety, you never had to lock your doors at night, they always tell me, um, of solidarity, but combined with um, strong state, you know, nationalist uh, 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 standing up for China's interests globally. That's essentially it. You scratch that deep, you don't, you don't get much. Some people at the margins of neo-Maoism are trying to think through what a coherent 21st century vision would be of a, 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 a neo-Maoist party, uh, and there's there's a couple of those folks, but by and large, the kind of foot soldiers of this are, you know. Uh, in fairness, it's like if you went to a Tea Party rally in 2008, and you said to me, tell me about Jefferson's first, you know, administration and which policies you liked best. You'd get a rosy version of, you know, freedom, liberty, you know. Now, that doesn't mean it's not, it's not important. And, the, and that the legacy isn't important, um, but if you're looking for sophisticated theoreticians, you've come to the wrong come to the wrong group. And what about my evaluation about Xi Jinping? Do you agree or don't, don't agree? Or what? what How strong he is? Yeah. It's a great question. It's one that we uh, are currently thinking a lot about because I think we uh, at Down CSIS don't feel like currently we have the right tools to make um, to make. Uh, evaluations of political power uh, in China. And so we're trying to think through what are new ways that we can make coherent statements of uh, Xi Jinping's relative political uh, stability, support, uh, or, uh, or opposition. Now everybody's guessing, and that substitutes for analysis. And I know because I do it myself. <laughs> Except he was able to amend the Constitution to end term limits. Yeah. So that is a but prima, the sort of prima the, facie case of great strength. But the undulations which we're talking about. You didn't about. have to spend what Mike Bloomberg spent per vote to get <laughs> just an additional, one additional term. What did he spend, 500, 600 bucks per vote? I mean, it was a lot. Xi Jinping didn't have to spend that. Daisy, you've got another yes, question. Last question yes. Xi Jinping, so China or Chinese people um, are used to having like the amount emperor a thousand years ago. <laughs> and the party always evolves depending on who actually runs the party. Unlike here, that you have 
it doesn't matter who runs the party, but the Communist Party is always like in China. So it's really relying on who at which time it's like Mao Zedong or Deng Xiaoping running. So Xi Jinping right now changed the constitution, getting all the power um, consolidated. Um, you started a lot on the previous leaders, Communist Party leaders. I guess my make a make a make a best guess who or what kind of legacy Xi Jinping wants to leave and who mm. is he comparing himself with? Whether it's Mao mm -hmm. replacing that big portrait or is like Deng Xiaoping. So as a rule, I never say what any of these folks are thinking. I haven't the foggiest idea. Um, we can read party documents. We know Xi Jinping is talking about rejuvenation of China. He's putting it in terms of, as previous leaders have, but he's emphasizing these 100-year goals. So this is the long-term, you know, the, the sustainability of Communist Party rule on a large stage with China returning to a, a larger conception uh, of its role in the world. Uh, I only know that from the documents in terms of what he eats for breakfast or what he thinks about his legacy, you know, who he compares himself to. I have my own personal hunch, but, but not a professional one. Um, that's kind of a, a, a to me, a, for analysts of this stuff, a dangerous parlor game hmm. because you start actually believing you, you think you know what, uh, what, what these guys want and honestly, who the heck knows. Stay in this room, what's your guess? <laughs> <laughs> I think kind of a, uh, nah, I don't want to. <laughs> I don't want to. <laughs> it's going to be wrong, so. Yeah. Time for one last, anybody with one last question? Okay, yeah. You mentioned about elders having a lot of power, especially during Deng's time. Who are the relevant elders now? And yeah. what kind of role do you think they play? You, know, you had a very, uh, you had uh, Lee Kong pass away. Yeah. And as, these, as they're getting older, it's just changing the what role would they have, and how does that impact Xi's Yeah, um, I hate to say this, but the death of every single elder is a is a is a victory for Xi Jinping. Uh, it's just removing more and more folks in the background who are who are obstacles. You know, the the recent round of rumors is that Song Ching Hong has been playing the the role of uh, of uh, critic in chief. Um, this is another one of those questions that the final page of Wittgenstein's Tractatus says, where if one cannot speak, there if one must remain silent. Uh, it's kind of my rule for a lot of these things of, like, I can take a, a, a stab at this. Uh, it's undoubtedly wrong because I don't have the foggiest idea how power actually works in Beijing. But just structurally on the role of elders, um, you know, clearly it, w with the passing of time, you know, we've seen Hu Jintao, I think we all know, doesn't play that active of a role as a former general secretary, whether that's by uh, choice or by limitation of his own, of his own power. Uh, Jiang Zemin has clearly been the sing single most powerful uh, um, elder behind the scene, but, but the guy's 243 years old <laughs> and has died, I think, every year for the past 10 years, <laughs> according to my Twitter feed. Uh, he, there's always a death watch for, for Jiang Zemin. Um, so, you know, um, Xi Jinping has done a really good job of um, stocking the, the bureaucracy and the party apparatus with folks who are closer in inclination to, to him. Um, elders just structurally. So the point of an elder was not so much that you're old, because then, you know, Jer you know then, then we'd have sort of George W. Bush playing the, 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 this large role here. It's that you had overlap with... Mao Zedong, you had some sort of, you, you'd put in your time in, the, in the, the glorious creation of the People's Republic of China, and you had that street credibility and charisma and connections within the party. You know, Deng, we think of him as an economic reformer, but the guy was in the, the army. He was running around fighting the Japanese. You know, he'd been with Mao in the Long March. A lot of these elders were, and as they start to, as that diminishes more than the fact that they're old, um, uh, their, their power in the system diminishes. So we're, we're with the passing of Li Peng, and certainly after folks were on the standing committee under Hu Jintao, once that generation really is gone, I think that the, the role of elders more structurally within Chinese politics will disappear to, to zero. There will be one elder, and he will be Xi Jinping. <laughs> this discussion has given you a flavor of what is in this new book. So it is available outside, <laughs> and we will keep the author here for an additional few minutes to sign your copies. But thank you so much for doing this. Thank you very much.